Right, back, welcome sir. to another broadcast of the North Carolina Masonic Research Society, and we are excited and thrilled to have back Brother Joe Martinez. Uh, Joe, it's always a pleasure to have you here. We love hearing your presentations. You're always uh, very entertaining and informative and enlightening. Uh, Joe is a member of Manassa Lodge 182 in Manassas, Virginia, Benjamin B. French Lodge, uh, number 15 in Washington, D.C., a uh, member of the United Grand Lodge of England and a host of other Masonic and esoteric uh, initiatic orders and bodies. So, Joe, uh, you're going to talk to us about the old charges and the constitutions of Freemasonry tonight, and I'm really excited about that. So, um, brother, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much. Let me uh, share my screen here. Boom. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right. All righty, everybody. Well, uh, welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, hope we can look uh, 2020 and look at it in our rearview mirror. So, um, but yeah, let's just start this year with some uh, awesome Masonic education or esoteric education or spiritual education, whatever you want to call it. Um, so today we're going to talk about the old charges and uh, Anderson's constitutions. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what they are. We're going to talk a little bit about what they do for us. And um, at the end, we're going to talk about why they're important. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why they're important from a, a practical practical standpoint, but also from a spiritual or esoteric standpoint, because there's a lot in there in the old charges that oftentimes gets overlooked um, or dismissed, and people just focus on the, the boring administrative crap. So um, hopefully at the end, we'll tell you why these old Masonic documents are, are relevant um, to our day-to-day -day activities and also why they actually give us a, a spiritual charge or a call to action um, that, again, like I said, oftentimes gets very much overlooked. So let's just dip right in. So again, we're going to talk about the old charges and what that term means. Uh, so for a lot of you that are, are not Masons or that are new Masons, you may have heard that term thrown around, but you don't know exactly what these things are or where they came from. So we'll, we'll cover that. And in a lot of these old charges, it covers um, the history of the craft um, from an allegorical standpoint, as well as a historical one. Um, and then we're going to end the conversation with Anderson's constitutions and what those are when they were written, why they were written, and uh, what, what things we can derive from them. And um, that's basically where the old charges end, uh, is when Anderson publishes his first constitutions. And then finally, we're going to talk about why they're important, again, from a practical standpoint, or a quote-unquote administrative standpoint. And then again, from a spiritual standpoint, why should these documents have something of meaning for me? Um, and they do. Um, and like I said, it, it a lot of times gets overlooked um, and, and glossed over, um, and I don't think that it should. So the old charges, like I said, are ancient documents that have come down to us in one form or another, starting in around the 14th century. Uh, some of the older documents, it's hard to date, but scholars have gotten fairly close with um, uh, dating some of these documents. So there's a, around 20 major documents that get thrown around in presentations or, or conversations or in Grand Lodge documentation. Um, and in total, there's about 100 total documents. Um, and a documents can be a, a, a piece of poetry or a, a parchment or a letter to someone, but they're documents that talk about some sort of masonry um, and the customs and practices built around it. And again, they go as far back as around the 14th century or so they think. And they also talk about the legends, the rules and regulations that we've now incorporated into our quote unquote traditional history. Um, most of these documents, their physical makeup is found in the form of handwritten paper or parchment or vellum. Um, and a lot of these were uh, found to be sewn or pasted together or comprised of these handwritten sheets that were stitched together um, in sort of a book form. And as we get later in time, when talking about the old charges, a lot of them have been printed in more modern book type forms. Um, some of these old manuscripts were found to have been incorporated into the minutes books of 
lodges in the past. Um, so that's where a lot of these things were found. Some, a lot of them were hidden in libraries or miscategorized or misnamed. So they had been written a long time ago, but they were only discovered more recently in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about documents that go from about 1390 or so to about 1715. And then when we talk about Anderson, you know, that basically starts the traditional Grand Lodge system of, of Freemasonry. Um, a few of these documents are truly quote unquote Gothic in nature. They come from the Gothic building period. And most of these documents are uh, safely kept nowadays in the British Museum and the Masonic Library in uh, Yorkshire, England. So before we start with the traditional uh, old charges, um, it usually starts with the, the Hallowell manuscript or the um, Regis poem as it's often uh, incorrectly named. Um, the actual name of the document is the Hallowell manuscript because that's the person who found it. Um, we're gonna talk about some lesser known ones that actually predate the Hallowell manuscript by a, a good bit of time. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the Statutes of Bologna or Bologna. Uh, which was actually written in 1248. And it's an Italian document um, in Bologna. And uh, it was a document written in Latin uh, that was written in the city of Bologna. And um, it is really an important document because it talks about the history of masonry. Um, but it's not really emphasized a lot because most of our scholarly works really start in in Britain, right? Um, that's where we think the birthplace of modern Freemasonry is with the birth of the, you know, the premier Grand Lodge in 1717. But um, this really is the oldest original quote unquote Masonic document that we found um, that talks about operative Masonry. And again, it's about 150 years older than the Hallowell manuscript and much older than some of the other ones we're going to talk about. So the, uh, it has a lot of information in it about the rules governing um, lodges and the people within those lodges um, that you'll find in Anderson's Constitutions. And he actually touches upon in Anderson's Constitutions um, at the beginning of it, that he researched documents from Great Britain and Italy and other parts of the world when he started to compile these constitutions. So it, there's very good chance based on what this document has in it um, and what you find in Anderson's Constitutions that he actually referenced this document. So the next document we're gonna talk about is the Book of Trades. So this is a French document that was written probably around 1268, 1270. Um, and it has the statutes and the rules of the, uh, what was called at the time, the Trade Union of Master Masons, Plasterers and Mortarers. Okay, so it covers Master Masons. And it actually uses the term Master Mason, which is interesting. Um, it has some really important tidbits of uh, Masonic trivia there because it talks about what you can do around having an apprentice, how many apprentices you can have, how long you must keep him in, in uh, service for you, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how you can't mistreat him, things like that. And um, this document, um, contrary to all the other Masonic uh, historical documents that we found, says you have to keep an apprentice for six years. And we see that later on in time gets changed to seven years and starts to fit our numerological theme when we're talking about uh, keeping apprentices and the like. And then the last one of these pre-Regis poem documents we're gonna talk about is the Avignon Decree. So this was actually a decree or a papal bull that was published by the Roman Catholic Church in 1326. So this is about 70 years before the Regis poem. Um, and the purpose of this papal bull and why a lot of Masonic historians treat this as a Masonic historical document and not just a, a Catholic document is that it talks about radically suppressing uh, societies, leagues, and conspiracies designed under the name of brotherhoods. Okay, so this is way before, you know, the 16 or 1700s when there were... Um, uh, papal bulls that said Freemasonry is illegal if you are part of this religion and the like. Um, but uh, there is one really super interesting bit that I want to read to you that's in the papal bull. And again, this is 1326, right? So 400 years before organized speculative Freemasonry came about. And what it says is that we resolve that any oaths taken by any members of leagues, societies, or brotherhoods 
uh, to be taken by these aforesaid persons are prohibited and valueless and that nobody may feel bound to observe them and we absolve them of their oaths. However, they'll still get a salutary punishment if they confess um, by taking those. So, and that they're forbidden under the penalty of excommunication that they're allowed to assemble, meet, gather, or take oaths or deal with any such practices, organize as a brotherhood, subject themselves to that kind of obedience, help and support each other mutually, wear any costume signifying what is from now a forbidden activity and to make other people members of that brotherhood. So we're talking about 1320s. We had a document that said, you're not allowed to be a member of something called the brotherhood. And again, this is 400 years before quote unquote organized Freemasonry as, as we know it today. It says, you're not allowed to make any oaths, right? But we call them obligations nowadays. So I guess that's how we get around it. Um, and that we are not allowed to meet together, congregate together or make anybody else um, do anything that we did to become a part of this organization. And it also says we can't help and support each other. So they don't want us doing any of it. Um, but again, these are just some lesser known documents that normally don't get lumped under the old charges, but they predate um, traditional Masonic history by, by a good bit of time. So now let's talk about the, the main documents that comprise the old charges that we're gonna talk about. The first one is always the Hallowell Manuscript, uh, which contains the Regis poem, okay? And again, it was dated to around 390 CE. Um, some more recent datings of it have it around 1425, but that it was taken from an older document. Then we have the Cook Manuscript that was uh, dated to around 1450 CE. And then finally, the Dowland Manuscript at around 1500 CE. Um, interestingly enough, the Hallowell manuscript is the first time that you'll see the term, so mote it be. Um, and I know that gets thrown around the internet all over the place. Um, if you're a Mason or you've been around a Mason, you've heard the term, so mote it be, normally after a prayer. Um, this is the earliest documented writing of it showing up in a traditionally Masonic document, right? And it's used in this form as, uh, you know, at the end of a prayer. So let's talk about these individually. So the Hallowell Manuscript, it is the earliest of the, again, traditional old charges. And when I keep saying traditional, I mean British. Um, most of the documents that comprise the old charges really are based on the British origin of Freemasonry. And, um, you know, and they were in charge for the longest amount of time. So we'll have to give them their due. Um, so the Hallowell Manuscript is 64 pages on vellum. Um, and it was bound together. And the difference between the Hallowell manuscript and all the other old charges that we're going to talk about is that this was written in poetic style. So it wasn't written in prose, uh, like a history book. It was written, you know, using poetry as its vehicle to provide this information. Um, and the poem begins by describing how Euclid, everybody knows who that is, um, imitated geometry. Um, the actual word that's used is counterfeited geometry, but we've kind of bastardized the term counterfeited to mean something illegal. Um, but counterfeited, you know, back then in the, in the Middle English was meant imitated. So imitated geometry and called it masonry. And they actually say that in the document for the employment of the children of the nobility in ancient Egypt. Okay. So this is where we start to get that traditional history that we have in your modern speculative masonry. Um, this is the earliest time you see it. And we're talking about a definitive act where Euclid went to teach the people of ancient Egypt, the nobility or the priesthood um, about the science of geometry, which he also calls masonry. So he uses that term interchangeably uh, in this document. And the document then relates how the spread of the art of geometry went to all these diverse lands, um, leaving Egypt, going into, you know, Western ancient civilizations, um, off into Asia, and then finally making its way into Europe. So he ends, or whoever wrote this, ends this, um, ends this document with, sorry, I was getting mad uh, emojis on Facebook. So feel free to put your question in on what made you mad. Um, this talks about how uh, the craft of masonry 
eventually ended up in England uh, during the reign of King Athelstan. So for those of you that have studied Masonic history or are part of certain appendant bodies, you know that Athelstan and the York legend feature prominently in a lot of your British Masonic history. Um, but it tells how all the Masons of the land came to the king, Athelstan, for direction for how to be governed and how Athelstan, together with his nobility, um, forged or created the 15 articles and 15 points that would rule lodges. Um, and again, we're, we're talking about predominantly operative masonry at this time. Um, speculative doesn't really show up as a term, uh, especially in this document, but the purpose of the lodges and what they're meant to do um, that really harkens back to um, a lot of speculative ideas about Freemasonry. So again, there's 15 articles for the master concerning behavior uh, of the members and operation of work. And then there's 15 points for the actual craftsmen, which, which follow a similar pattern. And then at the end of this document, there's warnings of punishments for those breaking the laws or breaking the ordinances that were put together. Um, and also a provision for getting together at an annual assembly. Um, so a lot of Masons are familiar with that. I mean, we get together once a year and do big grand things. Um, and then it talks about the legend. Uh, it gets back into the legend of, of Athelstan and the York origins of Freemasonry. So this is where you start to see the term York and York Rite start to show up a lot in our traditional Masonic history, um, which is a whole branch of, of Freemasonry for those that are not Masons. Um, so it was finally donated to King George in 1757, and it was actually one of the first documents that became part of the British Library. And it was named after a non-Mason, James Hallowell, who published the poem in a paper called The Early History of Freemasonry in England. And it was read before a Masonic society in 1838. It was not cataloged as a Masonic document, and it instead was a document categorized as a poem of moral duties. Um, so that's why we didn't know of its existence for such a long time. So now we're going to get to the Cook Manuscript. So it's the second oldest of these old charges, um, or these Gothic constitutions of Freemasonry. And it's the oldest known set of charges that are written in prose, right? So Hallowell was all poetry, and this one is written in po prose, and all of the subsequent old charges are written in a prose style. Um, it does contain a little bit of repetition to what you find in Hallowell, but compared to the actual part of the Regis poem, there's a lot of new material which you start to see once you get into Anderson's Constitutions. And if any of you are here that have not read Anderson's Constitutions, I entreat you to read it. It is a fascinating document and, and definitely read it more than once. Um, so this, this manuscript starts with a prayer. And then the first thing that this manuscript talks about are the seven liberal arts. And it gives its precedence in the document to one of those seven liberal arts, which is geometry and which is also equated to masonry. So this document also says geometry equals masonry. The two are interchangeable. Um, but then we start to get into some of the old biblical history um, in this document, more so than in a lot of the others. It talks about the tale of the children of Lamech, um, who you know is a biblical character and he's found in the book of Genesis. Um, it talks about his children and how their children found a lot of the seven liberal arts um, that became that, that ancient store of knowledge that needed to be passed on to, to future generations. So you have one child named Jabal who discovered geometry and became the first master mason. Uh, then you have a child called Jubal who discovered music. And then you have another child called Tubal Cain who discovered metallurgy and the art of smithing. Um, that should ring a bell with some folks. Um, then Lamech had a daughter as well, Nama, who invented weaving. So. Lamech children, busy people, creating all of this ancient knowledge for us. Um, so these ancient peoples discovered that the earth would soon be destroyed by a fire and a flood. And they inscribed all of their knowledge onto two pillars of stone, one that would be impervious to fire and one that would not sink due to flood. Again, this should resonate um, with Freemasons uh, quite a bit, uh, especially when we're talking about pillars, just probably a little bit differently. And... Um, Again, we're talking about the 1450, so 300 years before speculative Freemasonry became an official state-sponsored thing. So in this document, it talks about how um, generations after the flood, both of those pillars were discovered, 
one by Pythagoras, who you may have heard before, and the other by the philosopher Hermes. And the seven sciences were then passed down going back into the Bible through other biblical characters. Um, one was passed down to Nimrod, uh, who was the architect of the Tower of Babel, and one to Abraham, who taught them, who taught them to the Egyptians, um, which then brings Euclid back into the story. So now we're talking about Euclid being in Egypt, um, teaching the nobility of Egypt about this ancient secret divine knowledge and passing it on to their children and um, starting the spread of science or geometry or masonry to all other parts of the world. So while in Egypt, this gets passed down to the children of Israel and who in turn taught masonry to, to their children and it passed on and they built many amazing things, one of which we'll talk about. And then it starts to make its way back through France to England and then ultimately to King Athelstan again. So this document as well starts to talk about the York legend of, of masonry um, and brings in King Athelstan and um, that, whole, that whole legend um, that I'm not going to get into in details. So it was published in 1861 and translated from, you know, the Middle English by Matthew Cook. So again, these documents are named after the people that are finding them or publishing them and not so much for the, the authors, uh, many of whom we don't know who, who authored these documents. But Masonic researchers know that, that it definitely contained information from older documents. Um, and this document had information that was found in other 14th century uh, documents that weren't quote unquote necessarily Masonic. And then finally, the third of the most important ones, at least for me, uh, that we're going to talk about is the Dowlin manuscript. And it was first published um, in a gentleman's magazine, not even a Masonic one, in 1815. And again, it was named after the contributor, the person who published this document, James Dowlin. And um, it was a document that was meant to um, get people interested about Freemasonry or why it was published in a, in a magazine. Um, and it was found on a long roll of parchment and in a hand that definitely appeared that it was written later, but the, the way that the words were used and the language in it um, sounded like it came from a manuscript of an earlier date. And they still date the words, not the actual document itself, but the use of the language and the, the style of English that was used to around 1500 to 1550. Oops, sorry. Go back one. Can you still see my screen? Okay. Um, but again, it, it, it has a lot of similarities to the Cook manuscript in that it's the... Um, it talks about the, the knowledge and information proceeding from Euclid to the sons of Egyptian nobility. Um, and that the, uh, it talks about a lot more of the biblical origins of Freemasonry that we as modern Freemasons are accustomed to, uh, where it talks about the Temple of Solomon and King Hiram of Tyre. And it talks about how Masonry basically diffuses from the Temple of Solomon and works its way through uh, the Middle East into the southern parts of Europe and then into France and then surprise surprise Athelstan. Um, so it gets a bit more into the uh, the legend of Athelstan talks about his children and how they spread the work of masonry you know to all parts of the world. So why are these documents important? Um, the first thing is that they show a history that, that precedes the organization of the Premier Grand Lodge in 1717, right? So there, we, we all know that there was speculative Freemasonry before it got organized into um, an official sanctioned body in 1717. Um, we know that were people that were made speculative Freemasons well before 1717. Um, and we know there's minute books and documentation that talk about their transition from operative Masonry by allowing those non-operative Masons to come and join those lodges. Um, but why, why would they want to do such a thing? Um, these documents also talk about the liberal arts and sciences in such an important way um, when it's talking about why are they important and why are they important to humanity as a whole, right? So not just for this small collective group of people that love green beans, but why are they truly important? Um, and again, it focuses on geometry and most of these documents use the term geometry and masonry completely interchangeably, okay? They did, there was no differentiation between the two. 
Um, and again, they talk about the history of Freemasonry before 1717, right? And as we'll see in Anderson, um, it becomes a really long allegorical and quasi-historical um, history that a lot of Masons have attached themselves to, um, you know, which gives Freemasonry as a whole a lot more credence and weight and history and, and, and depth to it. Um, and again, they espouse geometry as the primary science. And um, a lot of these documents fill that gap between, for us, the building of Solomon's Temple and the guild slash lodge system of the post-Middle Age Gothic cathedral builders. So we're going to talk about an extra one. Um, it's not considered technically part of the old charges because it comes after uh, Anderson's constitutions, but you have this document called the Graham Manuscript, um, and it was probably written around 1725, 1726, but the information it contains absolutely comes from earlier sources, and it wasn't discovered until the 1930s. So the interesting thing about the Graham Manuscript, and the reason why I bring it up, is because it provides information prior to 1700 that is different than some of the information that you've heard in your traditional Masonic lodges. Um, but again, this existed for, for a very, very long time, you know, before we had masonry in America and, and other parts of the world. So the interesting parts about the Grand Manuscript are that the very first part of it is what you would consider a traditional catechism. Questions and answers um, that a lot of masons have to uh, go through in order to progress through the degrees. And then it also talks about the legend of the third degree. Um, from what I've seen, this is one of the earlier instances of a third degree actually being written down and talked about. Um, but what's interesting, and let me, let me step back for a second for those that, that are not Masons, um, prior to the 1720s, um, a lot of the Masonic historical documents, they only talked about two degrees in, in, in the uh, Freemasonic system. You had your apprentice level degrees and your fellow degree or your fellow craft degree. Um, and this is the first time that you actually see something referencing a third degree, um, which again is interesting because prior to that, there were only two degrees. And at some point we, we broke the fellow craft degree into two and added a third degree into the craft speculative Masonic system. So um, this is the first time it's talked about, but what's interesting is that this does not talk about the traditional third degree lesson that we talk about in the ancient landmarks or that most, if not all of you are accustomed to uh, when we're talking about um, the third degree legend surrounding Hiram. Um, this third degree talks about Noah uh, being the actual um, focal point for the dramatic play and his three sons as, as, the, as those fellows. So the way the story goes, and I'll, I'll keep it loose, um, it references that Shem, Ham, and Japheth went to their father's grave to find his valuable secret. They had previously agreed that if they could not find a secret, the first thing they found would serve instead. Sound familiar? For they believed that God would make this thing as valuable as the secret itself. So they're talking about a substitute for the original thing or secret. Um, so they came to the grave finding nothing but a dead body almost rotting away. They took a grip, and I'm not gonna get into more detail, they took certain grips and could not get him up. Um, and they tried it again and, and tried a third time and then they finally got him up. And then they talked about the manner in which they placed their father's body and what things were discussed that then became that third degree legend. But again, this is not stuff that you are accustomed to because it's talking about Noah and um, not the traditional story of Hyam or, or the Haramic legend that, that we're accustomed to. Um, Jason Richards, who everybody here knows, he does an amazing uh, presentation on Noachide Freemasonry. But I just wanted to put it out there that, again, especially pre-Grand Lodge uh, timeframes, um, there were different legends that were circulating around. And it wasn't, you know, uh, one size fits all and people were not doing the exact same thing. But with the formation of the pre 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 excuse me, premier Grand Lodge, um, things started to get organized and codified. So there could be some... Um, uh, similarities from going from one lodge to another. So that's why I reference it. But again, Grand Manuscript, really interesting document. Um, but again, it comes, it, it was uh, dated to around a couple of years after Anderson. So that's why we normally don't include it. So now we're going to talk about Anderson's constitutions. 
So for those of you that have been to um, the House of the Temple and have been to the library, there is a copy of Anderson's Constitutions that was published in 1734 um, that looks very similar to the one you find here that was uh, printed in 1723. Um, that copy was actually printed by Benjamin Franklin in 1734 for use here in the, in the colonies. Um, at a very young age. So uh, we had a copy of this about 10 years after it got published in, in London. So what are Anderson's constitutions? Um, they basically are the first comprehensive official document uh, talking about Freemasonry. They were originally published in 1723 and they were published, like I said, in the U.S. Um, well, it wasn't called the U.S. then, was it? Uh, in 1734 by Benjamin Franklin. And it talks about, the very first thing it talks about is a 40-page history of the craft. Um, and this is probably the most comprehensive history of the craft. Again, we're talking about allegorical and quote-unquote historical history of the craft. Um, and it goes from Adam all the way to the reign of King George I. And it talks about uh, a lot of characters you may be uh, familiar with, such as Noah, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, Hiram, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Caesar Augustus, Vitruvius, King Athelstan, Inigo Jones, and even James I um, of England. So it celebrates the science of geometry in this history. So um, again, if you've not read this document before, it's on archive.org um, and it's been uh, written in a way that you can easily understand it. Um, it doesn't have those Fs instead of Ss. Um, so knock yourself out and give it a read. Um, it talks about um, the different wonders of the world and how they were um, basically examples of this noblest of sciences or geometry or masonry. Um, and it talks about the seven wonders of the world such as the Great Pyramid, um, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the uh, Tomb of Masalis, and the Lighthouse at Alexandria, the Statue of Jupiter at Olympias, the Colossus at Rhodes, and the Temple of Solomon, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, it also talks about the charges of a Freemason. What is a Freemason supposed to do? And the regulations concerning the rules of conduct for individuals, um, and also the governing of lodges and their officers. So it's a really big document. And again, this comes, uh, depending on your, on your calendar, either five years or two years after the formation of the Premier Grand Lodge. So, but this document suggests that masonry in its modern anglicized form, I guess you could say, was rooted very heavily in uh, Old Testament. And that you're going to see, if you read it, um, there's lots of references to Old Testament figures being considered masons. Uh, or being called Masons. Um, ooh, excuse me. So uh, that's what we'll get into in a bit more detail as well. So when we're talking about the, the history of the craft, um, Anderson's constitutions are actually dated, um, and it actually has dates for a lot of the things that happen in your traditional biblical history. Um, it uses the annual Mundi system, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, but it looks like most of the dates are plucked from um, the Usher chronology. So for those who don't know what the Usher chronology is, it is a chronology that says the uh, beginning of the world was around um, 6,000 years ago. And uh, this gentleman or Archbishop Usher, who was from Ireland, I believe, um, around 1650, he basically dated the entire Bible and found the date of the creation of the world uh, going back around 6,000 years. And he used the dates and the times and the places in the Bible as a reference for building an entire chronology um, of the modern world. And uh, what's interesting is that he does use some good dates for known um, historical occurrences. Um, he actually did step outside of the Bible for certain things, especially when it came to uh, things that happened in Babylon and things that happened around the time of the Roman Empire, where they had ample records to support corroborating dates. Um, what I found most interesting about Usher is he was one of the first ones, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to say he was completely right because I don't think the world is 6,000 years old. Um, but he was one of the first people that actually stood up and said, hey, this AD system that we're using, this annual domini system, we're actually wrong because there's no way that um, the character, <laughs> the um, 
there's no way that uh, Jesus could have been born in 1 AD uh, because King Herod died around 3 or 4 BC. So he knows that they got those dates wrong and he tried to come up with a new system to reorganize your traditional dating system found um, in Christianity at the time. So let's talk about those dates uh, that uh, Anderson puts in his constitutions. So um, again, it's the Año Mundi system. Um, and Año Mundi one uh, starts with the story of Adam. Um, and he talks about how um, Adam, you know, our first parent who was created after the image of God, um, must have had the liberal sciences, particular geometry written on his heart. For ever since the fall, we find that the principles of it in the hearts of his offspring, us, uh, and which in the process of time have been drawn forth in a convenient method of propositions by observing the laws of proportion. So what he's saying is um, geometry or masonry was written in the heart of Adam, you know, our great, 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 great grandfather, and that he passed it on to all of his offspring. So now we're going to skip ahead almost 1700 years. Um, and again, he's dating things by chronologies and, and years that people are alive in the Holy Bible. Um, so for those that have read the Old Testament, you know that folks in the Old Testament lived a lot longer than we do today. So now we're going to touch on Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, um, who he, he called them all Masons true. Okay, so again, we're identifying Masons with people that we find in the Old Testament. And brought with them, after the flood, the traditions and arts of the antediluvians, um, which we talked about in, in some of the older manuscripts. Um, and how they passed it on to their offspring and perpetuated the, the study of masonry. So now we get to 1810 and we talk about Nimrod and who, again, we talked about was the, the, you know, a Mason obviously, but he also was the designer of the tower of Babel and um, how it passed on, on and on and on. So he goes over Mitzram, he goes over Abram who gets renamed to Abraham and then how the study of masonry makes its way into Egypt. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. And again, he's following this, this, um, Geneal genealogy from person to person to person and how the study of geometry slash masonry is, is moving forward in time and, and across the world. So, um, so it makes its way into Egypt and then through Egypt, it makes its way to the Israelites and goes to Moses and Bezalel and we know who Bezalel is um, and goes into the land of Canaan and then finally to King Solomon. Um, and he obviously gives a bit more, um, information about Solomon and his use of that, that ancient art of masonry. Uh, I'm sorry, you guys are covering my screen. Um, but it goes all the way up to the time of the exile. But again, he stops at King Solomon and gets into a very interesting description about, you know, how Solomon used masonry, you know, for the glory of God, um, and really tied those two together uh, in this document. Oops. So then we're going to move forward a lot of time to... Pythagoras. Um, so we know Pythagoras, he liked to travel around, um, studied the science of geometry. Um, according to some of the older manuscripts, he was one that found those anti, one of the people that found those antediluvian pillars that contain that ancient divine wisdom. Um, and uh, again, he was the author of the 47th problem of Euclid. Um, so a lot of you Masons will, will know what that means. But the study of masonry moves, keeps moving towards Zerubbabel, who we know had things to do with the construction of the second temple after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first one. Um, and now we're getting to uh, your, Hellenized, um, your Hellenized form of Egyptian monarchy when we're talking about the Ptolemies and that intermingling of Greek and Egyptian uh, society and political spectrum and thought and sharing of knowledge um, that really started to happen around that time. Um, and this study continues from the Greeks all the way to the Romans um, with Augustus Caesar, um, who started to build and build and build all over the world. So that keeps going and going and going until we get to the Saxons and, you know, the precursors of, of your modern English folk. Oh, sorry. Skipped ahead. Um, and then again, he stops again at Athelstan and gets into full-blown the, the York legend of masonry. Um, and again, if you've heard some of my other talks, um, 
I don't use the term legend to mean that it is a, a derogatory term, that it's made up. Um, I use the term to signify that it is a, a story that's been passed over time and is, is ingrained into a group of people. Um, so when I say legend, that's what I mean. So don't give me stink eye or angry faces on Facebook for that. Um, then it goes to the Normans, uh, you know, who conquered the Saxons. And uh, it goes through the British monarchy or the English monarchy um, through Scotland and Ireland, back to England, um, all the way to the formation of the uh, Grand Lodge of England. So that's where Anderson's constitutions end with the formation of the Premier Grand Lodge. So again, let's, uh, let's stop and talk about those seven wonders of the, of the world uh, that Anderson wanted to talk about. And again, this was written in the 1720s. But those seven wonders were uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, uh, the Mausoleum or the Tomb of Masalus at Halicarnassus, the Lighthouse of Pharos at Alexandria, the Statue of Jupiter at Olympias, and finally the Colossus of Rhodes. Now, what's interesting is that these were not the original seven wonders of the world. Um, Anderson actually inserted Solomon's temple uh, in place of this right here. The temple of Artemis at Ephesus was one of the traditional seven wonders, but I guess Anderson wanted to show love to King Solomon and his awesomeness. So he uh, took this one out because I guess he didn't like it and um, interposed Solomon's temple in its place. So for Anderson, these were the seven wonders and it included the temple of Solomon. So now here's the fun administrative part. So what did Anderson's constitutions do after this, you know, amazing history going back to the creation of the world uh, when it comes to the craft? He basically set down the charges and the rules that were established at the Premier Grand Lodge of England. Um, so again, Anderson wrote this document um, based on what had happened in London in 1717 or 1721. Um, when it came to how to govern lodges, how to form lodges, and what to do um, as a grand lodge or as a body of, of lodges. Uh, the first one concerned God and religion. Um, and this talked about uh, Masons obeying the moral law. And, quote, he will never be a stupid atheist nor an irreligious libertine. Um, so back then, they did not consider Masons to, um, you know, support atheism or agnosticism of some type. You had to be uh, someone who had a belief in a supreme being. And for most uh, Grand Lodge systems, that, that carries forth to this day. Um, on the civil magistrate, number two, that one talked about being a peaceable subject to the civil powers um, and never be, to be concerned in plots and conspiracies against the peace and welfare of the nation. So those of you that have seen Worshipful Masters being installed, um, you know that's one of their charges as well, okay, to obey uh, the laws of the state in which you live. This does not count um, any of our founding fathers. They all get a pass because uh, they made the United States of America. So um, the next one is uh, of lodges. So uh, they defined what a lodge was. Um, the lodge is a place where Masons assemble and work. Um, a society of Masons is called a lodge. So it referenced the building and it also referenced the society or brotherhood of people that comprise that organization. Um, and that they would have bylaws and they would have regulations and set up rules for um, how they should be admitted, that people admitted members of a lodge must be good and true men, freeborn, of mature and discreet age, no bondsmen, and no immoral or scandalous men, but of good report. Again, those of you that know your ritual, you may have heard this in, in one form or another. Of masters and wardens and fellows and apprentices. So this basically defines... Um, uh, what fellows, what apprentices are, and what masters are. And I've seen this, this actual um, uh, section of Anderson's Constitution has been misinterpreted in, in quite a few ways. So if you read all of Anderson's Constitutions, you will never see anything related to a degree of Master Mason. It does not exist in Anderson's Constitutions. When they're referring to masters, they're talking about people that were masters of the lodge. So in Anderson's time, at the time of this writing in 1723, there were only apprentices and there were fellows. There was no rank of, there was no uh, degree of master or master mason. Um, people who were masters were masters of their respective lodges. And at the time of this writing, there were four. There were four in London that got together and decided this and made up all the rules. Um, there were other lodges all around, but it was only four that comprised that premier Grand Lodge of England. 
So uh, management of the craft. This basically is what you see, um, um, what you see uh, in what we would call bylaws today, how to manage the craft. You know, when are they meeting? What are they doing when they meet? How many people comprise the membership? Are there dues, things like that? And then finally, number six, behavior how to basically act as a, as a member of a lodge. Um, you know, don't be a scumbag. Don't be a boozer. Um, you know, uh, when you do work, do good and honest work. Don't cheat other people. Um, don't have uh, private committees or private peaks and quarrels. Um, many of you have heard that term. This is where it comes from. Not to have, engage in private peaks and quarrels. Um, not, you know, avoiding all excess and not forcing anyone to eat or drink beyond their inclination. Um, again, these are things you hear in Masonic ritual all the time. And this is probably the first time you've seen it. And then we're going to get into, so uh, Anderson's Constitution basically defines what a Grand Lodge is, um, who comprises a Grand Lodge. And again, they're only talking about their small little, um, a small little portion of London that got together to form a Grand Lodge. Um, and then they talk about when a master can congregate, things you find in your bylaws. And then again, what bylaws are, um, what restrictions you can have. Um, and this is an interesting one because a lot of states nowadays do things differently. But for restrictions, they said, no lodge shall make more than five new brethren at one time, nor any man under the age of 25, who must also be his own master. So again, freeborn. And at this time, you had to be 25 or older. Um, Number five, uh, this is something that a lot of modern speculative lodges still do to this day, a time frame for inquiry. So no man can be made or admitted a member of a lodge without previous notice, at least one month being given to the said lodge. So that's why when someone tries to, uh, or, or you know, um, provides an application to become a Freemason, uh, most places have a, a layover period where you have to give the membership time to look into their character and also notify all of the brethren that um, there's someone who's applying for membership. Um, it also talks about here, unanimous ballot. Um, this is one of the earliest places where you'll see it, that a, uh, a ballot for membership has to be unanimous. And I think we're all accustomed to that. Um, it also talks about relief or charity of a new member. It actually defines um, how much relief or charity you should uh, be willing to provide to a new member. And in the 1700s time frame, it's actually a, a pretty penny. Um, demits uh, and new lodges. Um, it gives you the rules about that. Um, a lot of us have done that. Admonishments if you're being a bad Mason. And then who should represent lodges at the Grand Communication? And I know these are fascinating, so bear with me. Um, it gives you the rules for visiting other lodges. This one was really interesting because it went into more detail about people having different usages. So they were already under the, they were already under the understanding that different lodges did things in different ways. So um, forming the premier grand lodge was an attempt to start to give some regularity or some order to that. But they were saying, if you are gonna visit another lodge, you have to be aware they have different customs and usages and things like that. Uh, some of us experience that today, going from state to state or country to country. Um, and then all these other ones um, basically are the rules of the Grand Lodge, which if you actually read them, um, you'll see them in your own Grand Lodge documentation if you're Masons. Um, the order of business, who comprises the Grand Lodge, what happens if no Grand Officers are present, um, the requirement for being a Grand Officer, um, requirements for a deputy, what happens if a, a Grand Master abuses his power, and there was a stipulation that the Grand Line must visit all of their lodges at least once a year. So, all righty, and then finally, the last fun page was uh, what happens if the Grand Master dies during his term, when to convene the Grand Lodge. Um, they had specific dates around when the Grand Lodge should meet and around what dates. Um, there was a whole section on how to invite people to the feast at the Grand Lodge. Um, this is something that really doesn't happen anymore, um, where there's a big feast and all members of the Grand Lodge are, are expected to attend. So there's a lot of stuff about the feast. Feasting was very important. There were specific times and places where um, those feasts were to take place. So they were usually around the annual communication. And most oftentimes they were held on the feast day of St. John the Baptist or close to it, or St. John the Evangelist. So the Holy Saints John, um, they were required to meet there. 
and what happened, um, who would serve who at a feast, um, your, your requirement for attendance, um, who was allowed to be a steward, things like that. Uh, and basically a good few pages on what to do with the feast. So the feast was a really important thing. Um, I didn't see anything in there saying the minutes had to be read, um, but I did see about five pages on the feast. So why are these documents and why is Anderson's constitutions so important? Because again, they are the, the major compilation of documentation for organized speculative Freemasonry, right? We went from operative Masonry to speculative Freemasonry. And we saw in these documents that go back to the 14th century, how that progression happened and how these started to become the, the Masonic Lodge system that we're accustomed to today for those that are Freemasons. Um, it compiles that ancient origin, um, relying heavily on biblical and historical figures. And it also almost always terminates in um, that York legend of, of Freemasonry, which, which is the backbone of what we consider the quote unquote York rite of Freemasonry. Um, it, this actually is a misnomer. It says it defines the landmarks. It doesn't, it mentions the landmarks. Um, it actually doesn't define what those are, but it says you need to adhere to the ancient landmarks, but yet it doesn't say anything about what they are. And then finally, it talks about the basic laws of governing lodges, um, which a lot of us still adhere to today. And then that they required feasts, um, feasts with food and drink. Um, you know, here in the U U.S., we're not really awesome at that. Um, but this document commanded us to have feasts on or around the feast day of St. John the Baptist or the Evangelist, um, which are strikingly close to the summer and the winter solstices. So I wonder if that has any meaning. Um, so why do I think they're, they're really important outside of how to govern a Grand Lodge and, and all that kind of stuff? Um, so for me, the old charges provide a, a framework for what masonry is, right, or geometry, and, and how that knowledge traveled from its, its allegorical beginnings in Genesis and antediluvian times to the then present day of the 1700s. Yeah, they give us a decent insight into the history that we pull and, and use in our initiations. Um, they place the story of our search for light in the context of many historical and quasi-historical places and times, which, which I think gives us a beautiful and rich depth of history. Um, they show the transition in thought from the purely operative lodges to the speculative craft and the, and the purpose for having those degrees. Um, they denote, especially Anderson's constitutions, whether that was his intent or not, they, they denote the universality of masonry from its usage of ancient cultures and the migration of this secret divine wisdom from biblical Genesis to the flood, to Egypt, to the ancient Western cultures. And finally, to the height of civilization at that time of this writing, which was, was Europe and more specifically Great Britain. They define the purpose of Freemasonry. And if you read the text and put it all together, most of these documents are saying the same thing over and over again. And this is the part that I think is, is glossed over when people talk about the old charges. Um, it talks about that secret wisdom um, or that secret being passed down from, from the Adam archetype or, or earliest man through the pre-flood civilizations to the post-flood civilizations and onward to modern times. And it's the study of how the world works. It's the study of its forms, its designs, and the hidden machines that govern the underlying motions of creation. And that's what masonry is. So it's telling us what is masonry. Um, and it's the study of geometry, but geometry is, you know, not simply, you know, rulers and protractors and things like that. It is the study of how creation works. Um, and that we as, as Freemasons or Masons uh, are the guardians of a way to understand how the world works, how the universe works. And in that knowledge and understanding, we can, we can try, at least in a small part, uh, to understand that we're part of that grand design. You know, we are a cog in that machine. Um, we measure and, and learn that external stuff so that we can appreciate and acknowledge the beauty that's within, right? Going back to that macro and that microcosm, I think it's, it's spoken up beautifully in the old charges. Um, and in learning this, in learning masonry or learning geometry and learning the how of the world, um, we can at least know at least a little bit in part of, of our creator. So for me, that's the big secret of Freemasonry, um, all laid out for you in these documents, if, if you know how to read them. Um, learning about the how and the what of creation helps us understand the why. And in that understanding, 
we grow to love more and, and know more about creation than, than we ever did before. So here's my references and that uh, concludes my chit chat. Joe, that was fantastic. And I do want to ask you with uh, James Anderson, when he wrote his constitutions, um, I think it's important to, to understand. I think you, you uh, re referenced this, that those, those were not just things that, that Anderson came up, came up with arbitrarily himself. Those were some standard things around that time. He was just compiling all of this stuff into his constitutions to make it a little more, uh, I guess, a little more formal or, or to uh, reduce it all down to one place. Yeah, very much so. And, and the big thing with Anderson was um, nowhere in that document, except on a footnote on the last page, does his name actually come up, right? So um, he was basically charged to create this document after the formation of the Grand Lodge at their behest, saying, hey, compile this book of constitutions for us. Um, he started off, you know, according to the legend, he starts off with, uh, you know, making himself the author, but they took that out because... Um, they didn't want to have him get any kudos. So um, boohoo to him, but his name did show up in a footnote. And um, so that's the reason why. But but to your point, he even says it himself. Um, and that's why I went to some of those older documents, especially the Statutes of Bologna, where he says, hey, I've studied and compiled the great documents of Italy and France and England to put this all together for you. All right. Does anyone have any questions or comments or uh, threats for Joe? Just feel free to unmute yourself. If anybody over on Facebook has any questions or comments, please type them into the chats and I'll try to ask them for you. Hey, Joe, Christian from New Jersey. Um, quick question for you. I know that there's a lot of differing information out there on the subject, but what are your thoughts on Dr. Desigolier's contributions to Anderson's contributions? I've read conflicting uh, information on how participant he was in contributing to the Constitution? Uh, there was, and, and I, I think it, it really is, is a polarizing subject for historians. I don't have a dog in that fight, um, and Anderson's been dead for a really long time, so you know, I don't feel like, like I'm sliding him, but um, yeah, there are those that say that Desigulier was the one that, that provided most of the content, um, and there are others that say that Anderson really did, and you know, Desigulier got all the credit for it. Um, I honestly don't have a dog in that fight, um, but you know, the Segulier absolutely contributed something to what we now call speculative masonry. Um, you know, to say that he didn't is is absurd. Um, but who actually penned most of the document? I I, do, I couldn't say, and I know it's a crappy answer. I'm sorry. Any other comments, questions? Hey. Oh. Sorry. That's okay. Um, uh, I wanted to thank you for stopping uh, a few times to uh, explain things you said for non-Masons. Uh, that was really nice because I know this gets posted and it, it's a really great reference to have out there. And the images too were really, really good in the context. Too. Thank you. No questions, just comments. Thank you. Hey, Joe. Uh, great presentation as always. And and uh, I think in Anderson's uh, uh, writings, you missed one of the footnotes about reading the minutes. So you might want to go back and re-reference that. <laughs> Why, thank you, sir. Um, yes, uh, I, can, I can guarantee you having read this, um, they didn't say you had to read the minutes, um, but that's a, a conversation for another day. There was also no references about what needed to be served at the feasts, like green beans and, uh, you know, pizza and stuff like that. They didn't have that there. So... Um, but I will, I will double check again, sir. Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, serving green beans is in the code of uh, North Carolina Grand Lodge. Well, I'm not visiting there ever. <laughs> well, you know, uh, in our lodges uh, in Virginia, except for this period we're going through since uh, last uh, March, we always have a feast before our stated communication, and it might not be a feast as um, defined um, uh, in, in the open world, but we do have uh, uh, a meal with fellowship, and uh, all of our uh, pendant bodies and uh, families are uh, invited to attend, and they do. And 
and uh, uh, it's a very great time for fellowship, and it's really a feast. Uh, uh, we're sorely missing that uh, uh, these last few months. It's, it's really tough uh, uh, to, to uh, lose that fellowship. You know what? That, that's actually a really great point you made, uh, Brother Bill, because you're right. I, I, I agree with you partly that, you know, we do, especially at the, the lodge that, that Bill and I go to, um, we did have a fellowship dinner before our meetings and we, we encourage family to come. And I'd say we were probably one of the, one of the only lodges in our area where you actually had people's spouses and their kids and other family members come and share a meal together and break bread. Um, but we have in general here in the United States, we've definitely um, taken that feast thing and, and kind of converted it into a, a, a fellowship dinner. Um, and I'm not taking away from the, the fellowship aspect of, of breaking bread together, but um, you know, uh, and if Steven's still here, he can definitely chime in. Um, but you know, the purpose of the feast with the toasts and the prayers and things like that, those were very, very specific things that they did, which is different than what we do. Um, and I know, I know in the, you know, in the United Kingdom, they still do those, um, in most places. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's almost as ritualistic as the meeting itself. Um, you know, and the purpose of it and stuff. But again, I defer to Stephen, who's probably sleeping by now. Um, cause it's late for him, but, uh, but yeah, there was a purpose and there was a method to it. And, you know, again, it was equally as part of the quote unquote Masonic experience as, as, as the meeting itself. I see. Well, Stephen is actually still on. So Stephen, if you're awake, uh, would you like to comment on that? Man, you know, he's sleeping with the phone in his lap. Oh, there he is. <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, in, in uh, Virginia, we call that a table lodge. Um, and, and a lot of times we'll, uh, a lot of lodges will have, um, a table lodge once a year where we have the toast and, and the uh, ceremonies there. So that is really a feast, uh, um, that's available to us. And it's a really ritual, ritualistic, uh, program with that. Um, uh, so that's a very good thing for a, a definition of a feast. Great point. So Ben Sorensen asked over on Facebook, uh, what does Joe think about the old landmarks uh, and can we define them? And Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there is a defined list of old landmarks. It, it, you look at uh, different yeah. constitutions from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and uh, some of them define, you know, have varying differences in their landmarks they define as the ancient landmarks and some don't list the landmarks at all. So it's, uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Ben, the historian, for that question. Um, but uh, so I really take issue with them being called the ancient landmarks, right? The first time they're ever documented in any sort of form as the landmarks is 1858. So nobody ever before that time actually said, these are the ancient landmarks that we're going to adhere to. Um, the first person that does it is Mackey, um, first or second person, um, because they... Uh, they split them apart by five years between him and somebody else who actually published them. Mackey had 25. Uh, I forget the other person who published them. Um, he had 40 landmarks and different today, different grand jurisdictions pick and choose uh, which of those ancient landmarks they adhere to. But um, in general, most, if not all of them, at least here in the United States um, or in North America, they all adhere to a bare minimum of them when they go to the, uh, what is that, Conference of Grand Masters, um, that they all say, hey, you have to have these bare minimum of ancient landmarks, such as belief in a supreme being, and you have to have the legend of the third degree, and it has to be very specific, and you have to do things a certain way. So it does comprise some of the things that Anderson was talking about, and in Anderson's constitutions, he mentions it three times, that you must adhere to the ancient landmarks, yet he doesn't tell you what they are. So hopefully I answered your question, Ben. Ah, okay. Ben said that's, this is why I never said ancient. So kudos to you, sir. Yeah. But like I said, I take, um, and, and some I, I've noticed too, uh, not to get off on a rant, some grand lodges have it as part of their, their, their 
code book or law book or what have you. Um, like here in Virginia, this the the ancient landmarks are not part of our uh, what we call our methodical digest. That's our book of laws. But on our website, it says, hey, here's the ancient landmarks that we adhere to. Um, but again, it's not part of our rule book, which I've always found strange. But some do, the, the ones that, the Grand Lodges that still have the uh, Ahiman Razon, um, they'll have the ancient landmarks in there, um, in many of them. And, uh, but again, it's hit or miss and, and which ones they adhere to. All right. Anyone else with any questions or comments for Joe? Stephen, we're glad you're still awake and with us. Yes, I'm still awake. <laughs> you were nearly right. I was uh, just in between zones there um, <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you mentioned my name. Uh, I'd just like to switch sort of track slightly and, and, and go back to your reference with the Halliwell manuscript and talking about Euclid counterfeiting uh, geometry for the nobles, children of Egypt. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I was at a a uh, class today and, and um, it was a brother Alex Craig, he's a past master of um, Lodge Old and Verness co-winning St. John's number six and uh, just chatting away about the history and um, their minutes kind of start in 1678 but he's he, he mentioned something that, that pricked my ears up is, is that um, there's a legend that is thrown about the, the lodge that John D came to visit um, and a quite important visit in 1559. <clears throat> now, just to go back to the masonry and geometry intertwined, in the minutes, well, there wasn't any minutes pre-1598 um, in Scotland, but in those minutes, speculative masons aren't referred as such. They're they're marked in the minutes books as geometrical brethren, which I find quite fascinating. And um, he doesn't have any idea of when geometrical brethren were coined speculative with Freemasons, or you know, at one point, at one at what point were geometrical brethren sort of. Um, recognized in operative lodges um so i was just wondering your thoughts about that have you heard the, the word geometrical brethren i've not but it sounds better than speculative freemason um it yeah, sounds like cooler I, uh, I find it fascinating actually <laughs> indeed and and to your point well i mean i think the shaw statutes were published in 1598 right yeah, um yeah. so uh again those are um those would also be considered part of the old charges, um, you know, depending on what part of the United Kingdom you live in. Um, so if you're Scottish, um, you know, they definitely, and I think the Shaw statutes even tell you what Lodge kill winning, right? It forms Lodge kill winning, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Um, but to answer your question, I don't know. Um, I'd have to research that more. Um, mm -hmm. When we started calling them speculative Freemasons, um, the earliest, I think the only earliest evidence I know, and if someone knows different on this call, please chime in, is the earliest instance of the minutes of any lodge showing that a non-operative mason was being made a member of the lodge is Elias Ashmole, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was, um, I want to say around 1650, I believe it was. Don't quote me on it, Facebook universe, because um, I'm probably, but it was around the 1600s. Um, and that's the earliest time any minutes books show that. Um, but you bring up an excellent point, Stephen, where you have those minutes books from the, um, you know, late uh, 16th and early 17th century, um, where there's a lot of stuff in there um, about the governing of lodges and what was happening in those lodges well before the quote unquote premier Grand Lodge of England was formed in 1717. And again, that, that always chaps me that people think that that's when masonry started. Well, masonry has been around a lot longer than that. It just got organized and got an official logo and started doing Grand Lodgy type things uh, at that time. So, Yeah, and it almost seems to be that the, the geometrical brethren were basically the, those that employed the, the stonemasons, you know, the, the lawyers and the accountants and um, all the other upper echelons of, of, of 
the, the workforces. Well, depending on, right, depending, exactly right. So, um, and for me, at least, that's definitely one of my beliefs on how operative stonemason guilds started to become more of that quote unquote gentleman society when they started letting in their patrons, right? So mm -hmm. the people that were paying for all those things, it was basically um, giving them a place to meet and socialize and talk about those things, um, you know, which I've defined pretty clearly as to what I think they are. Um, but it gave them a vehicle to do so. So that started to overtake, you know, operative Masonic lodges, which were starting to not have a purpose anymore, right? After all the cathedrals were built, what were these people doing? I mean, yeah, when they burned mm -hmm. London down, they gave them work for 40 years, you know, rebuilding it, but that was about it. Mm -hmm. and, and giving them the title of geometrical brethren, I find quite interesting. I'm going to make mm -hmm. lapel pins with that. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now go to bed. Yes, I will. <laughs> Quick question. I, I noted that uh, all of the uh, history uh, as presented goes through the Saxon lines. And I'm wondering if anybody has done any work on the Celtic peoples that uh, also uh, had masons and, and uh, geometric uh, uh, brethren out there. Um, Certainly at the same time, if not before, uh, through uh, different areas of uh, Brittany, Cornwall, Ireland, uh, Scotland, Wales. Just wondering if anybody has done anything in that way. Uh, well, I, I can't give you an intelligent answer on that. Uh, but what I can say is you, you bring up an amazing point that, and, and I tried to touch upon this earlier without sliding anybody, that a lot of our definition of, of ancient Freemasonry really comes to us from Britain, right? Because they were the loudest and most pronounced, right? And they're like, oh, we started the Grand Lodge of England. Then you go over to Scotland, guys, you guys are full of crap because we've been doing this for way longer than you have, right? So it's that internal power struggle of who did it first. But to your point, um, there is differences uh, between Scottish Freemasonry and English Freemasonry and Irish Freemasonry that are pretty noticeable uh, even to this day. Um, we have a, a member of my lodge who I think has, has spoken uh, on Refracted Life, Don McAndrews. He'll be the first one to tell you that, you know, Irish Freemasonry and American Freemasonry are very, very similar um, to how they do things. So you can tell which lodges and which parts of the country learned their masonry and brought that over here to the state. It's different and, and their, their lineages break off pretty substantially between what you see in England and what you see here in the States and what you see in Ireland. Um, but no, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that, um, you know, the Shaw statutes were written in 1598. Those are considered one of the old charges. But if you look at any website about it, who do they bring up? They bring up all the old English ones, right? They bring up Hallowell and Cook and Dowland. So the answer to your question is, uh, Brother John, I don't know, but you definitely gave me a, uh, an interesting thing to, to look into for sure, because there is the records in Ireland and Scotland go as far back, if not farther back, when it comes to you know, operative masons governing and, and running lodges than they do in, in, in England. And maybe that wasn't true, but a lot of things burned down in London um, you know, with the Great Fire, so um, you know, doom on them. All right. Anyone else with any uh, questions or comments for Joe? Uh, Tim asked on Tim asked on Facebook, which is better, Scottish, English, or American? Um, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to say they're all beautiful and they all do cool things. Um, so, shut up, Tim. That, that's a very um... Diplomatic answer, yeah. That, that was a trap. <laughs> Tim and trying to <laughs> Oh, and Stephen said nice answer. So you are you are quite welcome, my brother from another mother. All right. Well, if there are no more questions or comments, we will uh, wrap it up. We've been going for a little over an hour. And Joe, again, that was a fantastic presentation. I know I learned quite a bit as well. And uh, a couple have asked, would this video be available later? So yes, yep. it is going to be up on Refracted Light immediately following this presentation. And at some point in the near future, it will be on the Refracted Light YouTube channel. So keep an eye out there. Feel free to share it with your lodges and with your, with your brothers. Uh, again, I think this is you know some important information that a lot of times 
in our uh, modern Masonic world, we tend to, to overlook or we really don't pay attention to where a lot of these things originated. So uh, I think when we talk about Anderson's constitutions, the, uh, the old charges, uh, these things are very, very important. And uh, I think we're starting to see a renaissance of some of that, some of that in masonry today. So with that, everyone, thank you for attending. Joe, thank you for being here. It was great seeing you again, brother. Great presentation as always. Love you, brother. Thank you for having me. I love you. Can't wait to have you back. And uh, everyone have a great night. Have a happy 2021. Hope things are uh, uh, go better for all of us this year. And we will see you hopefully next week. Good night. All right. Thank you. Good night.